Welcome, welcome if everyone to this special special event. We're delighted that you have joined us uh, this evening and thank you very much for coming. I'm Isabel Smythe and I'm the secretary to the Catholic Bishops, the Scottish Catholic Bishops Committee for Interreligious Dialogue. Um, but before we start the formal welcome, I'm going to hand over to Jamie Sparway, who's our technical advisor for this evening and the host of this event. And he's just going to remind us of some of the Zoom etiquette. Jamie. Thanks, Isabel. Yeah, I'm just going to be very brief, everybody. Um, so because it's quite a large group this evening, delighted to see so many of you with us, over 130 and counting. We're going to keep everybody uh, muted throughout the, the session, mm -hmm. but you can use the chat space just now. You can say your hellos that way. During the presentations themselves, I'll switch off the chat function so that it's not distracting for us as the participants, but also perhaps more importantly for the speakers. Um, we are recording the event as well. If anybody doesn't want to be shown in the recording, then just keep your video off throughout. Um, and the other thing I would say at the start is probably best to keep your view in speaker view. That's for those of you on a laptop, speaker view. And you do that by pressing the button on the top right hand corner of your screen where it says view. You can switch between grid and speaker view. And I'm suggesting you go into speaker view so that when you see the speakers uh, actually present, you'll see them taking up majority of your screen. Okay, thanks very much. I'll hand back to Isabel now. Okay, thank you, Jamie. And I should have said that Jamie comes from Interfaith Scotland because thanks to Interfaith Scotland for offering this support to us um, this evening. Now I will hand over to Bishop Brian McGee. Um, Bishop, Bishop McGee is the Bishop of Argyll and the Isles, and he has become the president of the Bishop's Committee for Interreligious Dialogue last year. So most of his involvement in interreligious dialogue this year has been through, um, has been virtual rather than, than physical. So Bishop McGee is going to put this evening into context. Thank you, Bishop. Thanks, Sister Isabel. So welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming to what originally would have been a full-day conference on human fraternity, but obviously, for reasons we all know, is a virtual gathering, although there probably are more people participating because of that. So I'm delighted to welcome everyone this evening, to welcome our two principal speakers, Cardinal Michael Fitzgerald and Dr. Shimala. We're also delighted to have with us this evening Miss Aileen Campbell, the Cabinet Secretary for Communities, our Bishop Mario Conti, my predecessor on the Committee for Interreligious Dialogue, and that's Bishop MacDonald and Father Jan Nodervik, who are responsible for interreligious dialogue within the Bishops' Conference of England and Wales. So this evening's conference is celebrating the signing by Pope Francis and the Grand Imnan from Al Hazar University, Ahmed. El Tayab on the 4th of February 2019, the document on human fraternity for world peace and living together. It was signed in the name of God and suffering humanity. And while in Abu Dhabi, the Pope said, there is no alternative. We will either build the future together or there will not be a future. So we've come this evening together in friendship and in the spirit of service to help the human family deepen its vision of hope and to commit ourselves as people of faith to work for a more just, equitable and peaceful society. We hope that we might celebrate this document each year, hopefully on the 4th of February, which has now been designated by the United Nations as the International Day of Human Fraternity and will be celebrated as such for the first time this year. And that way it can be a bridge between the Holocaust Memorial Day at the end of January and Interfaith Harmony Week in this first week of February. The document on, on human fraternity, as we know, has caught the imagination of many people throughout the world. It's also led to the setting up of the Higher Committee on Human Fraternity, which desires a more peaceful existence for everyone. It's composed of Christians, Muslims and Jews, and Judge Abdel Salam, Abdel Salam, sorry, who is the chair of the committee, has very graciously sent us this message of support. As-Sayyidat wa as-Salamu alaykum. 
يسعدني ويشرفني أن أشارك معكم اليوم هذا الحدث الهام الذي يأتي احتفاء باليوم الدولي للأخوة الإنسانية الموافق ذكرى توقيع وثيقة الأخوة الإنسانية بين قداسة البابا فرانسيس وفضيلة الإمام الأكبر دكتور أحمد الطيب شيخ الأزهر الشريف في الرابع من فبراير 2019 في أبو ظبي وفي البداية أود أن أتقدم بأحر التعازي وصادق المواساة إلى أسرة طيب السيرة أسكوف جلاسكو المطران فيليب تارتاليا وأقول لأهله وأسرته وأصدقائه أننا معكم بقلوبنا لقد سعدت كثيرا وأنا أراكم اليوم تجتمعون من مختلف الأديان والثقافات والأعراق إحياء لهذه الذكرى التاريخية لتوقيع وثيقة الأخوة الإنسانية إن فضيلة الإمام الأكبر وقداسة البابا قدم للبشرية نموذجا في الأخوة والصداقة والتعاون بين قادة الأديان بل بين كل البشر إنها دعوة أخوة صادقة إنها دعوة للمحبة دعوة للابتعاد بالأديان عن الصراعات دعوة تؤكد أن الأديان جاءت لإسعاد البشر وأن الأديان جاءت لتعاضد البشر وأن الأديان تؤكد أن البشرية طريقها واحد نحو السلام لكل دين هويته ولكل مذهب خصوصيته ولكن نحن نسير في طريق واحد يجمعنا من أجل الأخوة والسلام والأمان لكل الناس والآن جاء دورنا دور المجتمعات والمنظمات والمؤسسات دور المساجد والكنائس والمعابد ليؤكدوا هذه الأخوة ويوثقوا هذه العلاقة التاريخية بين الأديان هذه المشتركات الإنسانية بين الأديان إنما يجمع الأديان بالقطع يؤدي إلى سعادة البشر إنما يجمع الأديان يؤكد على أن الأديان لم تكن أبدا كما ذكرت وثيقة الأخوة بريدا للحروب ولا رسائل للكراهية وإنما هي دليل دائما هي دليل دائم للخير ولطريق المحبة ولطريق التضامن الإنساني والتعايش بين البشر وختاما أتوجه بالشكر الجزيل لمنظمي هذا المؤتمر الرائع وكنت أود أن أتحدث معكم أكثر من هذا إلا أنهم أخبروني أن الوقت ضيقا وأن الرسالة يجب أن تكون قصيرة ولذلك أؤكد لكم أننا في اللجنة العليا للأخوة الإنسانية هذه اللجنة الدولية التي شكلت للعمل على تحقيق أهداف وثيقة الأخوة الإنسانية بكل أعضائها وبكل إمكاناتها مستعدة للتشارك معكم ولتلقي أفكاركم ومقترحاتكم ومخرجات هذا الحدث الهام لنضعها موضع التنفيذ ولنأخذها بعين الاعتبار لأننا جميعا شركاء في تحويل مبادئ هذه الوثيقة التاريخية إلى واقع يعيشه الناس نحن بالفعل أحوج ما نكون إلى تحويل هذه المبادئ إلى قيم إنسانية إلى سلوك إنساني إلى مشروعات ومبادرات وهذا ما نعمل عليه ونتمنى أن تشاركونا فيه فطريق الخير يسعنا جميعا كما أن الأرض تسعنا جميعا وإن شاء الله الرحمة والمحبة تسعنا جميعا شكرا لكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So thank you to Judge Absalam for his gracious and kind words. We're also delighted, as I've said already, to welcome Ms. Aileen Campbell, the Cabinet Secretary for Communities and Local Government. Aileen has a very wide remit, but many of us here this evening already know her through her commitment to interfaith relations and a support for faith communities and interfaith initiatives. So we're delighted, Aileen, that you've agreed to address us this evening. Thank you very much, uh, Bishop McGee, for your introduction and a uh, warm welcome. And I'm really, really pleased to be able to be part of this conference uh, this year. And I want to, to thank you, the, the Catholic Bishops Conference of Scotland and the Scottish oh. Albate Society for organising this virtual gathering. And with it being a virtual gathering, it is a reminder as if one were needed of the fact that we are living in and continue to live in extraordinary times. The global pandemic has been awful and traumatic and has touched all of our lives. 
but it's also impacted on humanity in unequal ways and shone a spotlight on the deep-seated inequalities that persist in society here in Scotland and around the world. So this opportunity to be together, this space that you've created, is a moment to reflect how we can emerge from this pandemic and build forward to foster global peace and to think about how we live together to create a sustainable future. Because we have a choice in how we respond to what we've all been through. We can try to get back to normal because that is what is comfortable and a lot of what we yearn for. Or we can use the fact that because of the scale of the pandemic, we find ourselves with an opportunity to think differently about the future. The old i bean cultures of the life before the pandemic have been turned on their heads. And as a result, we need not simply accept or tolerate poverty and inequality as somehow inevitable. We instead can use the experience of the last year to build momentum for something better, something fairer, something kinder, a world with tolerance, love and understanding at its heart. And motivated by that shared desire to create a kinder society, myself and my colleague Shirley Ann Somerville set up the Social Renewal Advisory Board to capture some of that positive practice and culture change we have seen as a result of the pandemic. The kindness and compassion which we saw in all of our communities across Scotland as people and groups came together to roll up their sleeves and to look after and care for those in need of support, with much of that visible through the actions of our faith and belief communities, has been inspiring and for that we are sincerely grateful. Without that effort, the countries of resilience would simply have not been what it was. We wanted to also though get a sense of what we need to do to drive forward momentum for change. The report entitled from the entitled If Not Now When from the Social Renewal Advisory Board captures the mood and the moment that we have. And I'm so pleased that Maureen Sire from the Interfaith Scotland was part of the work because I believe the report and the calls for action provide a platform for us to collectively mobilise and agitate, not to just wish for fairness, but instead to work in partnership to make it happen. And I know that all the attendees at this gathering are equally committed to fairness, respect and for dignity for all. And interreligious dialogue is an important part of this endeavour. We continue to promote and support the development of interfaith relations and dialogue as an essential means of lowering barriers, eliminating fear and distrust and increasing understanding and mutual respect. Because the Scottish Government is completely committed to inclusiveness and tolerance where everyone can thrive regardless of their background, their culture, religion or race and where we celebrate the diversity of our communities in Scotland. We're only a country of five million, and so it makes sense that what we do, we do together. And what we can do, we do it together because together we can make that positive difference. But we also have challenges in Scotland. We are not immune from intolerance and hate. And for us in government, it means that we need to use the privileged position that we have to ensure that we do what we can to call out that hate and to use the leadership role that we have to foster solidarity and peace. So, in conclusion, I'm especially grateful to the organisers of this conference for providing an opportunity to examine and to think about how we create a more hopeful future. It won't be easy, but if we work together and work hard and relentlessly pursue the future eh, of a, a hopeful, kinder, more accepting eh, Scotland, then I know that the prize is worth all of that hard work and endeavour. And I know as a mum of two, it's the kind of country that I want both my laddies to grow up in. And I also think that this space is really important that you've created because um, we have had to live our lives online for such a long time. And sometimes the nuance and the respect and the tolerance that we see online is missing in debate. So it's really important that we have this moment to come together, to work together, to focus in on what unites us and binds us together and to use that as the platform to spring forward and to create uh, the kind of country that I know that we all want to see happen. So. Thank you very much for using uh, the, the, the anniversary of the, uh, the, the document as a, a moment for us to have this space to work together. And I certainly look forward to, to hearing some of the discussions and deliberations, but wish you uh, all the best for uh, a great conference this, this evening. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Cabinet Secretary. 
really um, not just for your for your words, but also for all your help and all your support of faith communities and also for interreligious dialogue. I hope you also feel that we are supporting you in this great work of trying to make Scotland a better place and to work for the common good. And I know that Maureen Sire was delighted to be part of the Social Renewal Group. And some of us took part in conversations about how we could contribute to that discussion. And and I think you'll find that the document that we're just now about to talk about is very similar. The, the ideals and the desires for a better world, very similar to those that you have expressed. So thank you. Thank you so much for coming. And it means a lot. And I know that you're thinking of retiring at, this, at the end of this um, a parliamentary session. So I know it's too early to wish you well for that because you've still got quite a lot of work to do, but we'll miss you. And we'll always be very grateful for what you've done for us as an interfaith community and also as faith communities in Scotland. So thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we now go on to the main part really of this event where we're going to hear from our two honoured and revered speakers, Cardinal Michael Fitzgerald and um, Sheikh Shamali. And they're going to tell us a little bit more about that document um, signed by the, the Pope and Sheikh Al-Azhar. Cardinal Fitzgerald, I'll introduce him first, was born in Walsall and he was ordained a priest as a member of the Society of Missionaries of Africa. He obtained his doctorate in theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University and a BA honours in Arabic from the School of Oriental and African Studies at London University. He has taught in universities in Kampala, Uganda, at the Pontifical Institute of Arabic and Islamic Studies in Rome, and he has also worked in Sudan. He was appointed in 1987, he was appointed secretary to what was then called the Secretariat for Non-Christians. We would never call it that now. now. The name has now been changed to the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. In 1991, Michael was appointed titular Bishop of Nepte and ordained by Pope John Paul II. In October 2002, he was appointed president of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue and was raised to the rank of Archbishop. On, in February 2006, he was appointed Apostolic Nuncio in Egypt and delegate to the League of Arab States. And on his retirement in 2012, he took up residence in St Anne's, Jerusalem, and then he moved to Liverpool. Um, there in Liverpool last year, in 2019, rather October 2019, he was created um, Cardinal by Pope Francis. I nearly said you were created Pope there, I have to tell you, Cardinal Fitzgerald, but you were only created a Cardinal in 2019. And... I don't know whether you're told why you're created a cardinal, but we all think it's in recognition of your great work in not just Christian Muslim relations, but also in interreligious dialogue. Cardinal Fitzgerald has authored a number of books on dialogue, on encounter between Christians and, and Muslims. And one that I think I must buy myself because I didn't know you'd written this, Praise, praise the name of the Lord, meditations on the names of God in the Quran and the Bible. I think I'll just go on straight and introduce um, Sheikh Shamali and then I'll let the two of you give your talks if that's, if that's okay. Hujat al-Islam Dr. Muhammad Ali Shamali is a graduate of the Islamic seminaries of Qom, Iran. After completing his BA and MA degrees in Western philosophy at the University of Tehran, he earned his doctorate in philosophy from the University of Manchester. He is currently the founding director of the International Institute of Islamic Studies in Qom. He is also the founding director of the Rizalat International Institute 
which is devoted to Islamic curriculum development and educational training, among other initiatives. He has led numerous Islamic educational courses and seminars in over 30 cities across four continents. Dr. Shamali is the editor-in-chief of two journals, The Message of Takalim, a quarterly journal of Islamic studies, and Spiritual Quest, a biannual journal of ethics and spirituality. His interest and participation in interfaith dialogue over the past 20 years has taken him all over the world. He has a list of publications, The Length of My Arm, but many of them um, cover Islam and Shia Islam. He has uh, written textbooks on Islam, and he has also co been co-editor of, Catholic, of Catholic Shia dialogue volumes. Um, he has um, one on studies in theology and spirituality, one on monks and Muslims, monast monastics and Shia spirituality in dialogue. And I'm glad to say that it's not just Catholic Shia dialogue that he has engaged in, but he is also co-editor of a Protestant Shia dialogue volume called Faith and Modernity, a Muslim-Christian conversation. So as you can see, we have got two eminent speakers this evening who are experts in their own right um, in Christian um, Muslim dialogue, as well as general interreligious dialogue, and who are members of faith and are men of faith and going to give us an insight into this document that they have been studying and have written about, both of them have written about it. So Cardinal Fitzgerald, I think we'll begin with you if we can, and if I can invite you to give your paper, and then Dr. Shamali, we'll move on to you once Cardinal Fitzgerald has spoken. Cardinal Fitzgerald. Right, thank you, Sister Isabel. So, we, as we've heard, this document on human fraternity for world peace and living together was signed on the 4th of February 2019 by Pope Francis and Dr. Ahmed Tayyib, the Grand Imam of Al Azhar. Last year, on the first anniversary of this signing at a conference in Rome, at the Lay Center in Rome, I was asked to speak about this document and I characterized it as being courageous, wide ranging, realistic, but also a work in progress. And I'm going to take those points again. So it is a courageous document. I think that the two leaders who signed this document have had the courage to engage with one another. Dr. Ahmed al Tayyib was the first Imam of Al Azhar to travel to the Vatican to meet with a Pope. I think it would be useful to give a little bit of background on the relations between Al-Azhar and the Holy See, the, the Vatican. They go back 50 years. The, the office that I was appointed to, as Sister Isabel said, the Secretary for Non-Christians won Pope Paul VI in 1964. But in 1970, the Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs in Cairo paid a visit to the Secretary for Non-Christians. And I'm sure that somebody from Al-Azhar was in this Supreme Council. So 50 years ago, there was always already a contact. Four years later, in 1974, 
a delegation from the Secretariat went to Cairo, and I'm sure that they also went to Al-Azhar on that occasion. There was a formal meeting which took place later in 1978, a formal meeting between Al-Azhar and the Secretariat. And then there is no record of any other meeting. In 1995, what was then had become already the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue, set up together with Muslims, with international organizations of Muslims, a liaison committee in 1995. Now, there were people from Al-Azhar present at the meeting where this body was, this liaison committee was established, but Al-Azhar was not included in the committee on the grounds that it was not an international organization, but a national organization of Egypt, although it had an international dimension to it. Now, the people of Al-Azhar were very disappointed not to be in this liaison committee. And they insisted so much, and they were so obstinate. Dr. Saman was the particular one who was negotiating for them, that in 1998, three years afterwards, a special agreement was made with Al-Azhar for relations between Al-Azhar and the Holy See. And in the meantime, Al-Azhar had set up a permanent committee for dialogue with monotheistic religions. And I repeat that. Permanent committee for dialogue with monotheistic religions. It wasn't just for dialogue between Muslims and Christians, but also Jews were included, at least in the division that was there. And after that agreement made in 1998, an annual meeting was held one year in Cairo and the next year in Rome and so on, between delegations of these two bodies. In the year 2000, Pope John Paul II made a visit to Egypt in the steps of Moses, and he visited Al-Azhar on the 24th of February, the year 2000. And after, he was very well, warmly welcomed in Al-Azhar. And after that, the Mus uh, Muslim partners asked that the annual meeting of the two groups, Al-Azhar and the Holy See, should take place on the 24th of February or around that date. Now, There was, of course, Pope John Paul II died, and he was succeeded by Pope Benedict XVI. When Pope Benedict XVI gave a lecture in Regensburg in Germany, this caused quite a lot of commotion in the, among Muslims, and for a moment, the dialogue with um, Al-Azhar was broken. The Sheikh Al-Azhar at that time, Sheikh Mohammed Sayyid Tantawi, wanted to visit Rome to speak with the Pope, but in fact, he was not able to do so. And as I've said, uh, it was uh, Sheikh 
uh, a Tayyib, who Ahmed Tayyib, who has been the first Imam to come to Rome to see the Pope. But for his part, Pope Francis, who succeeded Benedict XVI, accepted to go to Cairo to take part in a meeting for peace organized by Al Azhar. And he was the first Pope also to set foot on the Arabian Peninsula when he went to Abu Dhabi in February of 2019. So these two religious leaders have shown that they were ready to engage the members of their respective religions in discussion and action together, though neither of them would be surprised at meeting with some opposition. Not everybody has been in agreement with this document on human fraternity. And that is why I say it is a courageous document. The document is very wide ranging, and I think Dr. Shomali will say something about that. It underlines the importance of reinforcing the bond of fundamental human rights. So it emphasizes the rights of women, of children, of the elderly and the weak. But not only does it speak about rights, it speaks about duties as well. It speaks of the equality of rights and duties under which we all enjoy justice. It upholds freedom, including the freedom of belief, thought, expression and action. That is according to the English version of this document. The term translated action in English in Arabic is mumarisa, which to my mind suggests more the, the living out of one's faith, the practice of one's faith. Not just any sort of action, but the, the actual practice of one's religion. The common participation in living out one's faith. The document tackles also the problem of extremism and evokes the need for the protection of places of worship, of mosques, of churches synagogues, all places of worship. It calls for a culture of tolerance, which one could say almost by definition goes beyond mere tolerance, certainly beyond a laissez-faire attitude, since it stigmatizes individualism. It is really demanding moral regeneration. I come back to the problem of extremism. I think the condemnation of terrorism, which is uh, in, included in this document, is in fact very important. I'll come back to that later. So wide ranging, and some people have criticized Pope Francis for a document that is social, they say, rather than theological. And it is true that this document is geared more to cooperation in practical matters than to a deepening of theological understanding. And yet, it is based on a theological understanding of creation and sees the creative act of God as the foundation for the fraternity that it desires to promote. So it's not just a, sin, a social document, it is also theological in its foundation. And explicit references to God 
are very frequent. The journal Islamo Christiana, which I have here, which is produced by the Pontifical Institute of Arabic and Islamic Studies in Rome, has a special issue on human fraternity, last year's volume, volume number 45 of 2019, it's actually two years ago, of which Dr. Shomali has also an article and myself, we both have studies of this document in that volume. That's the commercial that I've put in here so that you, everybody knows. Islamo-Christiana number 45, 2019. Well, it numbered this document. It has given numbers to the paragraphs, which didn't exist in the original edition, but would make it easier to quote. So you will find mention of God in num paragraphs 1, 2, 3, 8, 11, 12, 20, 21, 24, 40, 41. How many? There are 42 paragraphs. So in at least a quarter of them, you find God mentioned explicitly and, of course, implicitly elsewhere. This document is all embracing. No one is excluded. The third paragraph of the introduction refers to all persons who have faith in God and faith in human fraternity. The conclusion invites to reconciliation and fraternity all believers, not just Christians and Muslims, but all believers. Indeed, reconciliation and fraternity among believers and non-believers and among all people of goodwill. I think that is important because it points to that this document is based not on, or fraternity is based not on religious belonging, but a more fundamental belonging to the human family as such. And I would say, as a Catholic, I would say that this is fully in agreement with the Declaration Nostra Etate of Vatican II. Nostra Etate, which is the dialogue chart, charter for the Catholic Church. As a Jesuit, Australian Jesuit, Father Dan Madigan notes in his article in the same journal, issue of Islamo-Christiana, faith is not added to our notion of humanity. We understand the human in the light of faith. The ample nature of the, this document, touching on so many topics, leads in fact to a certain vagueness. I'll just give a few examples. It speaks of the authentic teachings of religion, but it doesn't prevent, present any criteria for discerning which teachings are authentic and which are not. It urges at one point the establishment of full citizenship without explaining what it means by full. Citizenship we understand, but what is full citizenship? In advocating the rights of children, it calls on the family and on society, but doesn't really establish the relationship between these two realities. The importance of dialogue is emphasized, but also of avoiding unproductive discussions without any indication as to what might render the discussions unproductive. 
let us hope that our discussions this, this afternoon, this evening, will not be unproductive. The document is realistic. It takes into account change and progress in the world today, but also recognizes the presence of constant conflict and the injustice of inequality that exists in our world. So it is here that you get the condemnation of terrorism and of extremism in all its forms and particularly the condemnation of the use of religion to incite violence and war. And it's here that I think that this is a very important point because so often in, I would say in the Western world, people say that Muslims never condemn Islamic terrorism. And that's not true. But the Western media don't pick up these condemnations very much. They're much more interested in conflict than in the resolution of conflict. War makes news, peace doesn't make news. Because this document takes into account reality, I would think that it is a work in progress. The document doesn't pretend to have said the last word. They recognize the authors, those who've signed it, the two leaders who have signed it, recognize that the document is not a definitive statement. It's rather an invitation to engage in cooperation, in work together. And so I would classify it as a proposal and a project. The authors pledged to make known the principles contained in this declaration so that they can be translated into policies, decisions, and legislative texts. They expressed the hope that the document may become an object of research and reflection in schools, universities, and institutes of formation. In a way, this conference is a response to that appeal. Their inspiration, their aspiration is that it may constitute an invitation to reconciliation and fraternity among all believers, indeed among believers and non-believers and um, among all people of goodwill. And as we heard from Judge Abdus Salam, an application committee has been set up with quite a number of interesting people who are on this committee, including a Jewish rabbi. I have the names if anyone is interested in, in that. The fact that a representative of the Jewish faith has been included in the committee, in the, the higher committee for human fraternity, is a sign that the dialogue and cooperation is to be pursued not only by Christians and Muslims, but by and with others too, whether believers or not. And one could hope that the committee will clarify, will help to clarify some of the points in the document which remain rather vague, those that I mentioned above. The committee was already active in promoting a day of prayer and fasting for the end of this pandemic. And I think that this shows that its aim is to fulfill the program formulated as a kind of slogan. It's number 11 of the document. The adoption of a culture of dialogue as the path, mutual cooperation as the code of conduct, code of conduct, sorry, reciprocal understanding as the method and standard. So 
that is what we are invited, all of us, to do, to adopt a culture of dialogue, to engage in mutual cooperation, and to foster reciprocal understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Cardinal Fitzgerald, for that very clear account. It was interesting to hear the history of Christian Catholic Muslim relations and this uh, document, which is a project um, that we all hopefully will take up. Dr. Shamali, could I now invite you, please, to give your presentation on this, this document on human fraternity? And I must say, can I just say that I'm very glad that we put human in because fraternity is such a sexist word. I think I need to say that for all the women who are um, linking in. But the human fraternity opens it to all of us, brothers and uh, sisters. Sheikh Shamali. <laughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the compassion and the merciful. I am very delighted to be present in this a beautiful gathering and I am uh, very much reminded today of uh, one of my great friends who is actually a common friend between me and Cardinal Fitzgerald, the late Abbot Timothy Wright. And when we were going to publish the first volume of Catholic Shia Dialogue in 2004, he had uh, requested uh, the Cardinal to send us a paper and he sent a paper about Jesus in an Indian translation of the Quran by a Shia scholar. And then later when we had the second Catholic Shia dialogue, we had a, a message of appreciation from Cardinal when he was in the Pontifical Council for Intelligence Dialogue. We met in Castle Gandolfo when our Focolare brothers and sisters had invited us in 2002. And then I was also following up the great work he was doing. We also met in Com when he came with a delegation from Vatican. And also last time I think we met was in Urbaniana University in 2015, when it was the 50th anniversary of moving of Pisa to Rome. So I'm very happy to share with you, Cardinal, today this platform. And I salute the spirit of uh, my dear friend, Abbot Timothy Wright, and uh, I'm sure uh, he would have loved to be with us in this meeting. Uh, my talk today is my uh, understanding of the significance of this doc document for fraternal humanity and the potentials it has for leading in the years to come interfaith activities, especially when it comes to Muslims and Christians, but for sure it's uh, something that all people of faith and even no faith can appreciate because it's no longer just a theological reflection. I think it's one advantage of this document that has managed to go beyond the doctrinal um, boundaries and reach all major issues that we as human beings face and all the challenges that we have is very clearly inspired by deep faith and dedication of the Pope and the Grand Imam, but I think has the advantage of bringing the light of faith to the common life issues of all human beings. So I think it's going to be a guiding document for uh, all different kinds of uh, interfaith, intra, even intra-faith uh, discussions in the years to come. Arrival of the second anniversary of signing the document on human fraternity for world peace and living together by His Holiness Pope Francis and His Eminence the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, Ahmad al tayyib in Abu Dhabi on the 4th February 2019 
has not reduced the significance of this initiative and has not turned into an old news. It's a still a new news. Instead, as expected, we witness increasing and widening appreciation and acknowledgement of this historical document. Both parties have tried to build upon it. So they were really committed to have it in the first place and to let it grow. So they didn't just sign and left, no. For example, the Higher Committee of Human Fraternity, which we heard the message of the judge, Abdul Salam, and also uh, Cardinal referred to some of their members. So this uh, Higher Committee of Human Fraternity comprising some religious leaders, educational scholars, and cultural leaders has been established in order to follow up this and also to promote a culture of mutual respect and peaceful coexistence. Just one of the initiatives that we also actually uh, took part uh, was a day for prayer and fasting and charitable work on the 14th of May last year. And Ahlul Bayt Society of Glasgow and Catholic Bishops Conference of Scotland they had a day of prayer that we worked together. So that was one initiative. Something very important also is the fact that on the 3rd October 2020, Pope Francis issued the encyclical letter Fratelli Tutti on fraternity and social friendship, which the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar uh, very rightly said, that this is an extension of the document on human fraternity. And I had an interview with Chitanova, the Italian magazine for our folklore uh, brothers and sisters. And I said that I believe that two documents express the same message, the same concerns and the same wisdom. Whoever reads these two documents would find that one is like a detailed and expanded version of the other. They show how the true faith is truly universal and so are the challenges we face. We no longer have walls that divide us and the problem are no longer only on one side of the world. The great challenges are common to all of humanity. What made me very happy is that the encyclical letter shows that Pope Francis uh, finds in the core of his mission uh, also, the same thing that he says in the document, which is signed by Muslim leader. So you don't see two different types of messages. One, for example, for interfaith, one for the Christian community. It seems that they are really uh, covering and supporting each other. Uh, last year, we had a roundtable on the first anniversary of this document of human fraternity in Glasgow. And uh, it was interesting. And actually it was last year that it was decided that this year we would have a series of events. Uh, unfortunately, because of pandemic, we couldn't have all of them, but I'm grateful to God that we have this one today. And actually now more people are able to join because of online. I hope uh, many uh, programs and courses would be held and it is interesting that Al-Azhar has actually introduced to their curriculum a course on this document. And I think some other institutions in the world are thinking of that, or maybe I have already started. So now I want to share a little bit some of uh, my uh, thought, uh, thoughts about this document. Our biggest threat and concern in today's world is not the question of a rivalry between Islam and Christianity or which religion is going to dominate the other. I think this is an old mindset that some of Muslims or Christians maybe had before. Maybe in some parts of the world also still, this is the mindset. But the reality is that this is not the challenge today. I remember once uh, uh, I was uh, talking to Executive Committee of World Council of Churches, 
And I said, as an imam in London, I used to be imam of uh, the community in London at that time. I said, my challenge today is not that a Muslim youth becomes Christian. This is not the challenge today. My challenge today is families breaking down, people are stopping faith altogether, and lots of issues which relate to morality. This is the challenge today. So the document has very well and insightfully identified problems that we face today in a spirit of fraternity, not in a spirit of rivalry or competition, like you know, two suppliers who are fighting over the same market. This is no longer the mentality of uh, the Pope or the Imam or uh, Muslim and Christian leaders who th share the same attitude. The document on human fraternity shows how the Pope and the Grand Imam and their institutions were able to go beyond ethnic, cultural, and even doctrinal differences and boundaries and turn to face of God. I think this document could not be written and agreed on without deep spirituality of the Pope and the Imam and trying to find out the will of God and seeing the face of God in this project. What they grasped and presented in this document is no longer limited to the sphere of the church or the mosque. Rather, it is a universal perspective that can truly be a meeting point between Islam and Christianity and other faith traditions. And to a large extent, not maybe 100%, but to a large extent, it can also appeal to people with no faith. The document on human fraternity facilitates dialogue because it presents issues on which we can all discuss and collaborate. Sometimes people wonder, you know, what are the main things that we can talk about and have productive discussion? I think we have here uh, really urging issues that we can always, as faith communities, talk about. In addition to highlighting the fundamental and urgent issues for today's world, it shows that if we go deeper, that we are first of all human beings called to face the same challenges. If we stay tuned to the true nature of human beings, we realize that we have a responsibility to work together so, to solve the painful problems that afflict us. Some of the problems that are mentioned in the, this document, for example, poverty, social injustice, discrimination, inequality, the arms race, corruption, moral decline, and desensitize human consciousness. Distance from religious values and replacing supreme and transcendent values with worldly and material ones. Terrorism, individualism, weakening of family and a extremism in all kinds. Religious extremism, atheistic extremism or agnostic extremism. So these are major issues of today that are, are addressed in this document. The document in a bid to work together for a brighter future invites us to reflect over and implement the following points. One, to establish fraternal ties and consequently love and collaborate with all human beings, especially between Christians and Muslims. Number two, promote a culture of dialogue, mutual recognition and respect. Number three, a spread a culture of tolerance and coexistence. Number four, we discover the values of peace, justice, goodness, and human fraternity. Number five, revive the human conscience and remain grounded in religious values. Uh, the document, as uh, uh, Cardinal Fitzgerald mentioned, has frequent mention of God, religious values, which is something that is very important, but also welcomes engagement of people of no faith and acknowledges their also uh, full participation in solving these problems that we face as human beings. Number six, observe moral values, especially in international encounters, relations between different countries, different world organizations has to be also driven according to moral values. 
to avoid despair, isolation, and religious or atheistic extremism. Number seven, attend to the world's injustice. Number eight, safeguard family life. Number nine, do not misuse religion for legitimizing violence. The document very clearly says God does not need anyone to use his name to legitimize you know, violence and cover up their you know, interest in, and thirst for power or economical you know, interest. So this is very important. Number 10, respect the freedom that God has granted to mankind. 11, respect the rights and dignity of women. Sister Isabel, this is for you. Number 12, <laughs> preserve the rights of children, the elderly, and people with special needs. 13, secure equal citizenship for all members of one's society. Number 14, protect places of worship. Uh, this is especially important because unfortunately we see sometimes in the names of faith, uh, people uh, attack places of worship of other faith, and this is absolutely wrong. It has no place in a scholarship. It's just short-sightedness, and many times it's just political game. So the Quran actually very clearly in several places talks about God protecting places of worship and mentions uh, mosques, churches, synagogues, and monasteries, in particular, monasteries are also mentioned in the Quran. Uh, number 14, protect places of worship. Number 15, end all terrorist activity in the world. No way to talk about good terrorism or bad terrorism. Every kind of terrorism has to be uh, avoided and rejected. And number 16, form good relations between the East and the West. It is also very interesting because somehow, uh, not only uh, Al-Azhar and what it can represent Islam and Christianity, sometimes they can help also the dialogue between East and the West. So that is also very interesting in this document. Uh, there are some reservations, maybe theological reservations about some of the issues in this doc uh, document. For example, when it is talked about the relation between divine will and pluralism and diversity of religions, you know, how much we can say, you know, really God wanted us to be so divided. And, you know, so uh, these are things that we can, of course, in theological discussions reflect on. But what is interesting is that they have been able to find common ground to put their steps firmly uh, for such document. Uh, it's not easy, you know, I'm sure every line has a history of discussion and, you know, using different words so that can be agreeable to both parties. It is my firm belief that certainly this document is one of the most important interreligious documents of the last 20 years. And I think it was sincerity, fraternal respect, and love along with hard work of scholars on both sides, which made it possible. And we thank God for this achievement. And as the Quran says in chapter 13, verse 17, when God talks about the truth and falsehood, he says the example of truth and falsehood is like when river uh, is bringing water, which has come from rain, you would see that there are bubbles on the surface which can cover, but after some time, those bubbles go away and only water remains. And the Quran says, what is of benefit to humanity remains. So this is a good news that whoever does something beneficial for humanity is going to remain. And I'm very hopeful that this document and all the work that you are doing for this dialogue is going to remain because this is what benefits humanity. Thank you very much. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shmali, for again a wonderful, clear account. And thank you too for your optimism and, and encouragement for, for the future. Uh, that really finishes the first half of this evening's uh, programme. What we are planning to do is to to allow is to ask and invite, and they have agreed to do it, Sheikh Shamali and Cardinal Fitzgerald to engage with one another in a conversation and a dialogue over this document, which hopefully will just take us below the surface and help us understand and appreciate it a bit more. Now we've got the opportunity to listen in and in a dialogue between Cardinal Fitzgerald and Sheikh, Sheikh Shamali. Uh, hopefully that's going to kind of give us insight into the document and also stimulate our own thinking and our own commitment really to this work of inter interfaith. So Cardinal Fitzgerald and um, Sheikh Shamali, I think uh, you should now be in uh, Spotlighted, yes you are. Um, Cardinal Fitzgerald, your microphone is off, so could you unmute yourself please, so that we can hear you? Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, How long do we have in conversation? Because there will be questions as well. Are there questions or not? Well, we do have some questions. Yes, we do have some questions here. Um, but we thought it would be a good idea to get the two of you talking to one another. About 20 minutes for all of that, let's see, is what we've planned. So would you like to start then? Have you got something that you'd like to begin the conversation? Well, I, I mentioned the article of Sheikh Shomali in Islam of Christiana. Um, which I have to admit that when I read it, first of all, I was a bit dismayed because it seemed to me that he was saying, well, it, it, there's no difference between Christianity and Muslim. We, we, we're really one book and one religion. He based that on the Quran. And I said, well, I could do the same instead of saying one book, we have one person, one Jesus, who englobes, englobes everyone. So on a second reading, I found that you were much more, um, you were accepting the, the differences. You, you, you didn't deny the differences between Christians and Muslims, but I would say that your article, your attitude is God-oriented rather than religion-oriented. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> this is all I am trying to do. <laughs> and, you know, I, I uh, actually think that um, uh, we have to learn from our religions uh, how we can look at things from a godly perspective. And sometimes this is not easy because up to maybe a certain degree, our religion and what God, you know, is uh, considering may be the same. But I think after some time, uh, there is a maybe a limit in the lens of religion. And therefore, uh, I th think we should always try to train ourselves to be able to see how God is looking at humanity. God is looking at our religions and religious practices and religious communities. Uh, you know, like for example, uh, I as a son for my father, uh, I can understand that my father loves my siblings and wants us to be together. But it takes me time to be able to look at my siblings in the way that my father looks at us and not just the way I try to you know, be kind because my father wants me to be kind. Uh, if I can look at my siblings and myself in the way that my father looks, then I'm no longer the center. Uh, I am, yeah, so I think this is something that we need to really work hard 
to understand and to be able to see face of God in every without saying they are equal, they are all the same. No, uh, the differences are there, and uh, there are lots of things that you know they differ, but uh, still, I think we can understand that God loves all of them and God somehow is uh, happy to uh, you know be associated with all of them not equally but they are you know godly entities in the end of the day and we should try to serve all not just my community and not my faith and so you are very right actually this is, is, trying... is a very important uh, statement in, in this document on human fraternity, in one striking statement, yeah. God the Almighty has no need to be defended by anyone yeah. and does not want his name to be used to terrorize people. Yeah. I, let God be God. God is much, as, as you say, God, but you also have a phrase, the, the question for truth is part of our commitment to please God to the best of our ability. How do you understand this quest for truth? So my understanding is that we need to always search for better presentations of the truth. It can be within my tradition, it can be outside my tradition, truth belongs to God. And uh, I should always till end of my day be in the search of truth. Even if I can, uh, you know, make a, one tiny piece of truth more known to me, I should try. I should not say because my religion, you know, it comes from God, you know, we have monopoly over truth and there is no truth anywhere else. No, if there is any truth, it's manifestation of God, and we should always be looking for better understanding of the truth. Al-Haq. Al-Haq, exactly. God is, is truth. Right? Yes. Yeah, actually, the Quran says that the reason we should serve God is because he is Al-Haq. The difference between God and idols is that God is Al-Haq, and they are false. So, I don't say every person should be happy with what they have and they don't need, you know, to study more or, you know, think about other possibilities. No, we should always struggle for understanding truth better. But at the same time, this doesn't mean that I say uh, either someone has all the truth or they don't have the truth at all. Yeah. So the there is a very uh, fine border between saying everyone is equally right and between saying that we all have some percentage of the truth, some share of the truth, something that can make us happy. In, in a document produced by the Secretary for Non-Christians, so back in 1984, it defined dialogue yes. as dialogue, interreligious dialogue in which, in which Christians meet the followers of other religious traditions in order to walk together toward truth and to work together in projects of common concern. Yes. Now, there were many Catholics who didn't like this. Walk together toward the truth, but we have the truth. We believe in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Why should we be walking together with Muslims towards the truth? We have it. So a later document said, well, the fullness of truth received in Jesus Christ doesn't give individual Christians the guarantee that they have grasped the truth fully. Yes. In the last analysis, Truth is not a thing we possess, but a person by whom we must allow ourselves to be possessed. We are still always in the progress towards the fullness of truth. Yes. We don't have it. And so we can help one another in this. I think that is important. 
maybe uh, I can be bold to say that maybe more important than the truth is truthfulness. Because you may have the truth, but you, you are just inheriting the truth. It's not important. Truthfulness is very important. Your search and dedication to the truth is very important. And even if a truthful person makes mistakes, it's okay. But if by chance you have the truth, but you are not committed to it and you are not submissive to it, then it's not going to help you that much. You, you say somewhere in your article about religion, that religion is to submit your faith to God. Yes. Would you like to expound that a little bit? Uh, yeah, because uh, the Quran says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ دِينًا مِمَّنْ أَسْلَمَ وَجْحَهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَهُوَ مُحْسَنُ You should submit our faith to God and do uh, good deeds, bring you know, yes. good deeds. So the first thing is orientation. By trying to uh, turn our face to God and surrender our will to God, then we would bring good to this world. We would bring light to this world. You become like a mirror that reflects the light of God to this world, the love of God, mercy of God to this world. So religion cannot be uh, without this effort to turn towards God and reflect godly qualities to the world. If I miss to bring godly qualities to the world, it means that I have turned away from God, not I have turned towards God. So this is the meaning of submission. And Islam, as I, I have said in the also article, is actually not the name of uh, the religion of prophet of Islam is what every faithful person is trying to do. And that is to be an instrument for the will of God to happen among us. So if I am a good Muslim, you cannot judge it by my appearance or you, you can judge it by how much I am bringing godly qualities to this world and how much people can feel presence of God in my work. I think this is the sign of being faithful. Some, some people say that the purpose of dialogue is to help Buddhists be better Buddhists, Christians to be better Christians, Muslims to be better Muslims, and so on. I don't like that formulation. Mm. I I don't think we'll, I can say, I, I want to shake Somali to be a better Muslim. No, I want him to be more oriented towards God and, and reflecting God. So I, I want people through dialogue that we help one another to be better persons, to be better human beings, to be as God wants us. Yes. So it, it's really God oriented rather than religion oriented. Yeah. You would agree with that? Yeah, I, I, I think we should help each other to get closer to God. And then what being closer to God means for different people can be different. But, mm -hmm. uh, but the main thing is that we should help them to be closer to God. Maybe for most of people, being closer to God is within their own tradition. But maybe sometimes it's within another tradition. But the main thing is, I should help them in their journey towards God without me imposing my way of journeying towards God on them. But for, with full honesty, I cannot always say, you know, they should remain forever in whatever. No, yeah. yeah I, I, Do as God leads you. Yes. Yeah. Try to but find I, the will of God. Yeah. Cardinal Fitzgerald, could I just kind of interrupt, not interrupt, can not contribute even, but it's just there have been one or two little comments and chat that I think kind of fit in here that okay. someone 
you know, when you talk about the focus should be on God and helping people be more God focused, does that mean then that in working together, we should be more humanity focused? Um, someone said that perhaps really what we should be about is not talking about religion, but showing the world out there that we're concerned with humanity at the moment, particularly concerned about ecology. Then someone else asked a question as well about what then would be your theological issues with this document, especially Sheikh Shamali in Islam? And it kind of also connects with a kind of question, or not even a question, but a kind of, and it's not even a concern, but I have noticed that in interreligious dialogue, a lot of what we do now is focus on working together, that the other dialogues don't seem to be so important. And in a sense, really, from what you're saying, that we help one another focus on God, does religion then play a lesser part in this dialogue than it would have done in the past? So it just links with a couple of questions and comments that have come into the um, chat box. I, I think that the, the, the focus of this document is really, as I said, it's really practical rather than theological. It's not, and maybe the theological discussions are held to be unproductive. But um, I think we, we derive our motivations from our own religion, and we have to deepen that. It's the, the dialogue between people of different, among people of different religions doesn't mean to say that we abandon our own religion. And we, we, we deepen, certainly my own experience is that meeting Muslims, God-oriented Muslims has helped me to be more God-oriented in my own religion and to see this in a different light. And um, so I think that the, the other forms of dialogue, the, the dialogue of prayer, for instance, that we are maybe silent before God together. This can be very important to help us. And mm -hmm. um, I think also that we cannot work together unless we trust one another. So that has to be built up, this trust and friendship and and. It's it's not just working together, it's it's being together, doing something. I I quoted this morning in a talk, um, Saint Exupéry, who I think says that uh, when people are in love, it's not that they're gazing uh, in the eyes of one another. It's when they're gazing in the same direction. They're looking in the same direction. So. We want to look in the same direction and as God is leading us. Sheikh Shomali. Yes. Um, this is very important. You know, the issue of silencing also before God. I think uh, many times we have spoken on behalf of God and did not let God speak. <laughs> so uh, I think... Uh, when we trust each other and we establish unity, uh, then we need to listen together to God. I you know, use this uh, expression. I say uh, we need to listen to God with two ears. Yes. Muslim ear and Christian ear, because God sometimes speaks to both ears. God sometimes speaks to one ear. We don't want to miss anything. Any wisdom, any inspiration, any guidance from God, if you are really thirsty for that, it doesn't matter how you have received it. You shouldn't say, no, I only take it from my own sources. So we need to listen to God with both ears and maybe even other ears also. But uh, this document is more about Islam and Christianity. So... If we don't filter God's messages, if we don't, you know, uh, narrow down and indeed just use any opportunity to widen our listening to God 
and silencing our ego, even religious ego or sectarian ego, then I think we would be in a better position to receive guidance from God for the ch challenges that we receive today. Because I think God has guidance for all generations. It's not that he guided previous generation and we need just to, you know, uh, imitate what they did. God has guidance for all of us. So with new issues that we face, but within the same tradition, but we can always receive new ways of being loyal to the tradition, but build upon the tradition, go further. And here our uh, joint efforts and joint invitation to God to be present among us and to take us forward, I think is very important. And I am sure God wants us to be together and working together. And even when it comes to people of no faith, our work together and our unity can give them, you know, some kind of reassurance that we are not acting because of benefit of my religion or my, you know, sect, etc. Uh, they, I think, if one thing they expect from godly people is that they should have no ego, and in this way we can hope that we have no ego when we are able to work together and overcome our differences. So I think one of the beautiful things in this document is that it shows that it was a result of trust, unity, and not being egoistic. Could I just um, ask also, that just kind of reminds me a wee bit about both of you said or mentioned that in the document, it talks about authentic religion, but we don't know what authentic religion is. And I think that when, the, yeah, yeah, that when you talk really about listening to God, that sounds wonderful, but religion is not known for listening. It's known for talking and talking in very kind of direct terms. And sometimes um, what it says is not very godlike and that we're very often expressing our beliefs. Now, someone has asked the question, what do we do when people um, perpetrate violence, abuse, terrorism in the name of God, presumably really believing that they are doing right? How do you persuade those people really? that um, they are not, you know, speaking or acting in the name of God and that how, um, you know, what is their authentic religion? I mean, I don't know about you, Sheikh Shamali, but I often meet Christians and think I don't like their Christianity. I like my own Christianity, but I don't like theirs. And I don't know if mine's more authentic than theirs, but how do you explore that and how do you show the world what you are you're actually saying about religion being listening and seeking the truth with others well first of all i would say we have to pray for these people and i i don't always do that but i think we have to pray we're not going to change their minds we can't change their minds it, it's it's only God who can change their mind. We, we can't convert anyone. We can, can't convert ourselves. We have to be converted. Uh, now we can, and I think we do have to show that from our distinctive religious tradition, that to, to call on religion to uh, justify violence is wrong. We have to explain that, but we, we're not necessarily going to convince the other people. We have to pray that they will be convinced that by, by the truth. The truth is greater than them. Sheikh Shamani. Yeah, I think certainly prayer is very important. And also I think in our part, uh, we should do lots of educational work and lots of work together. So, Maybe some people, you know, takes time to wake up, but education, I think even if it takes time, it's a very, I think, productive way. And we should leave no chance for someone to misinterpret religion. If they want to do what, whatever they want to do is fine. Just we should not let them do it in the name of religion. 
And uh, I think it's not something that we can solve it over a year or over a decade, but these joint efforts and producing literature, courses, training of imams, scholars, priests, all different kinds of you know, people, based on this understanding, I think can help us a lot. May not, may not eliminate the problem, but I am sure would reduce the problems. When they see uh, high level leaders, they are working together, there is unity. I think uh, can change mindset of many people, not all, but many people. Uh, and uh, I think we also need to say that religion is also a matter of listening for sure. You know, one of the qualities of the prophet in the Quran, which actually was criticized by uh, some infidels was that he was listening a lot. Or the Quran says, uh, chapter nine, they were annoying prophet saying his ear he was listening so much and when a prophet can listen why we cannot listen we are not receiving revelation from god we should listen to each other and a sign of a good faithful person i think is happier to listen than just talk you talk when necessary but you should be willing to listen whenever people want so i think uh, we have to learn some manners in our ministry and in our, you know, priesthood or, you know, imam job, which would allow for listening more, not, not only to people of our community, people of other communities, because one of the most important things that we have to do is to uh, assure people that there is a caring heart for them in us. And that is through listening. I think that many people who would say, Christians who would say, well, all Muslims are terrorists. Mm -hmm. They've never met a Muslim. They, they don't know them. So I think that to facilitate also meeting with people and, and more visits and, and showing people as they really are. Yes. This, exactly. this, this helps. Yes. Mm -hmm. I have another question, which I think is a great question for you. What does unity truly like for you? What is your vision of unity taking into account the differences in religions? Yes. You want to... Silence. <laughs> We're listening. <laughs> <laughs> Don't listen for too long please <laughs> we don't well we can experience unity but it's it's never a complete unity we can i'm thinking of married couples they say they they become one but they have to work at it as well and then they, they we change and we grow and we're and circumstances differ and uh, so I don't think that we really know what unity is. Unity is, is God and God is beyond us and we're, we're going towards that but we will never, never exhaust it. We'll find out later, like, inshallah. God will. We will find out later what unity is, but we work for it. We have an idea. Uh, yeah, uh, I agree. I, I think unity has different degrees. And there is a degree with which you can have unity with every person, every human being of goodwill. There is a level of unity. But with some people, you can have a stronger unity. So, I remember once uh, with some Christian friends, we had a panel uh, in uh, American Academy of Religion and we talked about Muslim Christian relation. And then a lady came afterwards to me and said, when you talk about Muslim Christian, you know, unity, I am afraid and, you know, frightened, you know what? And I said, we don't unite against any person. Our unity is at the service of humanity. And then I mentioned this example. I said, when you throw a stone 
into, uh, for example, pool, there are ripples. These ripples don't exclude anyone. They just grow and grow and want to embrace everyone. But when they become wider, then they become weaker. It means that with people who are closer, you can have a stronger unity. With people who are farther away, you can have wider unity, but would be weaker. So I don't need to, for example, define my level of unity in the way that it can be applicable to all people of faith and no faith, because then I have a stronger ground for unity with people of faith. So it's not either this or that. We build unity upon unity. And I think uh, theologically, normally, for example, they say, you know, people who share with you more doctrines, people who are from your denomination, you have, can have a stronger unity with them than people of other denominations from the same faith. But I think actually, maybe this is true to some extent, but the reality is with people who are God-centered, if you are God-centered, you can have the maximum unity. Maybe there is a person who is a Shia Muslim and I don't feel that much united. And with a Sunni, I can be very united. Or with a Muslim, I am not united. I can be with a Christian who is devoting his life to God, more united. If I am really God-centered in my life, every person who is God-centered, I can have maximum unity with them. And I say, if God is not enough to unite us, what else than you are looking for? Is there anything greater than God? <laughs> Thank you. And I'm very conscious that we are getting towards the end of, of, of this evening. In a way, I'm sorry I didn't have the two of you just talking to one another from the start. But, <laughs> but could I just um, have maybe one more question? Because there's someone who's had his hand up for quite some time and very patiently been waiting. Hamid, would you like to unmute yourself? Do you have a question to ask? If you can unmute, we can't right, hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, all, or, uh, for everybody. Uh, it is not about a question. It is, in fact, to add uh, a couple of things. I think the fraternity and being together, having a unity, is to be based, first of all, on self-respect and respecting others and respecting other people's point of view to the extent that when we talk, when we have a dialogue, we are not about, it's not about actually uh, differentiating I am right or you're wrong or you are right and I'm wrong, but it is about getting points together and discussing different religion is, 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 it should be in a healthy way to get us closer to God rather than... Uh, Having showing our differences and say my way is is the, is the right way and yours is the wrong way, and unity is something that cultivates a good nature in us, and within and through that we transfer it from each of us will trans transfer it to the rest of the community by being able to help each other when somebody in need needs help we regardless whether he's Christian or whether he's, he's Muslim or, with, or whether he is Buddhist, for that matter, it should be uh, there as human beings. We help each other in that. We will come to, together to help that person rather than say, oh, stop, he's not a Muslim or he's not a Christian. And also the second point I want to mention is try not to criticize each other and try not to, uh, as, as we say, be a sort of building a wall by trying to tell to our communities, which a lot of uh, religious leaders in churches or in, uh, in mosques for that matter, uh, try to, uh, to, to convey a message of saying to people, uh, it has, it, since he's not a Muslim or since he's not a Christian, he's not one of us. And therefore, it has to be uh, uh, a division, a, 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 divide, a divide between us. And that's wrong, because first of all, uh, God is a merciful, uh, and as such, whether it's the same message in Christianity, it's the same message in Islam, and it's the same message in Judaism. All God's religions are uh, based 
are based on these uh, qualities of being merciful, being able to help each other, and being able to uh, listen to each other and live together in, uh, in, in a coordinated way that we, we don't, we do, uh, none, none of these religions actually, uh, if, if we look at the, uh, the texts in, it, in themselves, are uh, saying inciting hatred or inciting uh, the division or inciting uh, uh, other things that are not good natured. So th therefore, uh, therefore, that unity is a good thing. And having this- hey, Hamid, can I, Hamid, can I interrupt you? We're, we've only got five yeah. minutes left. So very, thanks very much for your input. Hamid, okay, thank so, you. Thank, thank you very much. You. That just underlined exactly what, what our two speakers have been saying. Could I just now hand over to Sheikh um, Pat Dean, who's going to give the vote of thanks. Um, and uh, Sheikh Pak Dean is the imam who is um, works with the Al Bayt Society in Scotland. He is he's based in Glasgow, but in fact is in Combe at the moment because he travelled there and then didn't get back to Glasgow because of because of lockdown. But he's become a good friend of us all in Glasgow and has become very involved in interreligious dialogue. Mohammed Pak Dean, Sheikh Pak Dean, would you? Thank you, like Sister to Isabel. give the vote of thanks. Thank you. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, salam alaikum, peace be with you. Rumi, the famous Iranian poet, says, Chashmi daram hame pura surat dust, bodi demara khushas, chundust darust. I have two eyes which are filled with the image of my friend, my brother. I love my eyes for they perceive my beloved. A big thank you to everyone for attending, Cardinal Fitzgerald and uh, Sheikh Mohammed Ali Shumali. A special thanks to you both for the enriching and insightful talks. You both made some very important points. Uh, Cardinal Fitzgerald, the point you made about the document, this document to be objective of research and reflection in schools, universities, and institutes of formation is especially important and inspiring. I certainly hope that our community here in Scotland and other communities move in this direction. I'd like to also add that these kinds of uh, fertile discussions can and should extend beyond uh, the scholarly or academic sphere and into our own circle of community, friends, and family. Through genuine dialogue, we can go beyond religious tolerance and peaceful coexistence and reach higher levels of fraternity and unity. It seems that until these debates become a public discourse, one cannot hope for its fruitfulness at the level of social relations in the society and that has been one of the most important goals of this conference to bring such discussions into the attention and concern of individuals in societies. The document on human fraternity is a significant document that provides the grounds for more dialogue. Sheikh Shumali, I was particularly fascinated by what you mentioned that uh, what they grasped and presented uh, in this document is no longer limited to the sphere of the church or the mosque. Rather, it is a universal perspective that can truly be a meeting point between Islam and Christianity and other faith traditions and to a large extent people with no faith. I believe uh, that uh, we need to pass this message of fraternity and unity to next generations and teach our children through our words and actions that a flow human being is either a brother or sister in faith or our equal in humanity who deserves our respect, care and love as brother Hamid mentioned. We hope and pray that the seeds of fraternity and love are planted in our hearts and that they blossom into something beautiful that bears fruits for all to enjoy. I'd like to end with a tradition from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in which he says, a believer is a mirror for his believing brothers or sisters. In the absence, 
he wishes them well, and in their presence, he tries his best to remove their pains and problems, as well as pave the way for their progress. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sheikh. Thank you. Perfect ending. Thank you. I'm sorry we have to go, but we have to go. And I think we're going wanting more. So that's great. That is what we want. So thank you very much to everyone. Um, keep safe, keep well, and hopefully we'll, we'll meet again soon. So bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>